It was apparently a winter night back in 1804 that Thomas Jefferson had completed all his work and he thought this was the night he would do what he'd long planned to do. So he went into his office and took out two English Bibles and turned to the Gospels, put a folio, a kind of un unprinted book at that point, on his desk and pick out a penknife and began to uh, slice the Gospels. And as he sliced the Gospels and laid them in plans, he was carefully choosing those parts that he thought authentically represented who Jesus really was. He didn't think that uh, Jesus was God the Son. He didn't think that he had done miracles. But he thought his teachings were significant and they were valuable. And so as he cut them out, what resulted was a book filled with uh, a long line of deeds and statements and teachings of Jesus, which he was convinced were the real Jesus. And he took that folio, had it bound, put in his, uh, in his library entitled The Philosophy of Jesus. He didn't tell any people about it. Uh, he knew that it might be politically difficult to do, and so it sat on his shelf for 16 or 17 years. But 16 years later, on another night, he had a desire to work on it again. And so this time he took out two English Bibles, two French Bibles, and a Greek and a Latin, Latin Bibles, and he began to work through it all again and to choose those passages which he said were the authentic Jesus. And he compiled them in four columns, one English, one French, one Greek, one Latin, and this time he had it again labeled, but he called this one the life and morals of Jesus Christ. This one would go on to become better known. As a matter of fact, later Congress actually had them printed and distributed to everybody in Congress and to a number of others. But Ab uh, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He did not believe in a God who intervened in human affairs, but he called himself, and I quote, a real Christian. That is to say, a disciple of the teachings of Jesus. Jesus was an excellent man, and he claimed the right to pick and choose what he thought were the deeds of Jesus. He wrote to John Adams in 1820, around that time, that uh, the worthy parts of the gospel, and I quote, were easily distinguishable from the worthless, as distinguishable as diamonds in a dunghill. The uh, early Christians, he thought, were ignorant, unlettered men who uh, didn't understand better, and they had put down superstitions, fanaticisms, and fabrications. So, Thomas Jefferson arrived at a Bible when he could look in the Bible, and amazingly, when he looked in the Bible, it was like looking in a mirror. What he saw there was Thomas Jefferson, the kind of teachings and deeds that he would have done, that he approved of. He's not unique in that. Um, but the trouble is that his story is clearly not, his Jesus is clearly not the Jesus of Scripture. It isn't the, the, the Jesus who know, was known and taught by those who followed him and knew him best. As a matter of fact, even Jesus' enemies didn't deny his miracles. They just said his miracles were done by demons and demonic power, but they couldn't deny the miracles that he did. But more than that, not only is it not the Jesus of the Bible, it isn't the Jesus of history either. I mean, why would anyone never mind the leaders of the Jewish people and the Romans conspire to crucify a person who said the sweet kind of things that Jesus spoke in the Bible that resulted. And why would people be willing to live, give up their lives, move around the world disturbing everything they knew to take the message of someone who they believed was God the Son? See, miracles aren't something that you can just extract from the life of Jesus. They're woven into all that he did and all that he was. And so over the next uh, weeks, we're going to look at some of the miracles that were done by the Lord Jesus and try and think through them about what they were, what they are saying, and how they work in terms 
of his life. But this morning, I'm going to be uh, a little bit different. Rather than going through a passage of scripture uh, as we normally do, I want to just step back a little bit and ask the question in part, can we even believe in miracles and then think about the miracles of Jesus, what they were, and then what they said and what they ultimately say to us. So let's begin by looking at a couple of passages of scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, which is obviously right at the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. He's just recorded him uh, in Matthew chapter 4, being tempted by Satan and then beginning his ministry. And then we come to verse 23. And in verse 23 we read, And he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease, and every affliction among the people. And his fame, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, that's up into Gentile territory. And they brought him all the, disease, the sick, the afflicted, with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics. And he healed them, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. Decapolis means 10 cities, and it was 10 Gentile cities, sort of in what we know as basically the Jordan Valley and in the country of Jordan today. And from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now turn over a few uh, chapters to chapter 11. Chapter 11 and verse 2. And when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are, pardon me, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended in me. Now, other things happen in this story going down to verse 20, and we're jumping into that. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth long ago, in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted in heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And then one other passage over in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, just one verse. Verse 22. Peter is speaking. It's what we know as the day of Pentecost. And it was the birthday of the church. But he addresses in Jerusalem those who were present. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Now what I want to begin to think about is two basic questions. What, what are miracles? What are we talking about? And then... Are they even possible? How do they happen? Now, those are obviously both huge things, and so we're going to simplify and perhaps oversimplify. But let's talk about what are miracles. We use the word miracles in all kinds of different ways. Uh, some of you will remember when the United States beat Russia in a hockey game back in 1980, and at the end of the game, Dick, Dick Enberg shouted out, Do you believe in miracles? Yes, as the siren went off and the game was over. And for every hockey fan in the world, that seemed to be about as close as to a miracle as you could get. 
Now, then a few years later, you remember the plane landing on the Hudson and it was called the miracle on the Hudson as this full jet landed and nobody's life was lost because it had been struck by birds or birds had entered and it had to land on the Hudson River and that amazing rescue. And we have others and you'll hear people say, oh, it was just a miracle when I watched my child born. Or as I've heard several people say in different contexts and not wrongly that uh, this so-and-so is a walking miracle. What, what do we mean by talking about a miracle? Because all of these things are miracles in only a, a kind of separated way. Interesting, the Bible doesn't have a word miracle. Rather, it uses a series of words, and we just read three of them in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, when it talked about Jesus doing mighty works, signs, and wonders. One of the word is a word powers, mighty works, works that were unique in their own way. The other word is wonders, things that make you marvel. And the third word was signs. That'll be an important word, and we'll follow that through. Pointers to something else. Not events that have meaning in and of themselves simply, but they had a larger meaning. And then the other word that's used in the New Testament is simply the word works. If you don't believe what I say, believe me for the works sake. So what are we talking and thinking about when we talk about a miracle? Well, Commonly, people say a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And while that's helpful in one way, it's not very helpful in another way. First of all, we have to ask, well, what are we really talking about when we're talking about the laws of nature? And are there sort of laws, absolutes that are unchangeable in their way in nature? Really, when we talk about the laws of nature, we are talking about the way nature works as we've observed it and described it in an ongoing way. But violation, we'll come back to that in a moment, imparts another meaning to it. Sometimes we think about a miracle as an unlikely, unexpected event of some particular kind. When all the doctors thought there was no hope, Suddenly there was a recovery. People had been praying. Now, I have no doubt that that was a remarkable event. I have no doubt that it is an answer to prayer. And yet we need to recognize that somehow when we get to the New Testament, a miracle is something more than that and something significant to that. Because doctors give their diagnosis, but at best, and with all due respect to them, they recognize this is my educated guess based on all kinds of experience that this is not likely to result in prolonging of life. But somehow, it does. But when we're talking about a miracle in the New Testament, we are talking about an event for which no natural explanation is possible. In which there is nothing that we know of that can account for water becoming wine. And we can account for grape juice becoming wine, but not water becoming wine. It is no way naturally explained how a dead person lives, how a withered hand suddenly is made whole in a new way, so a man blind from birth suddenly can completely and accurately see. Now, those are actions that in the long way for which there is no adequate explanation. If only nature was involved in the process, those things would not have happened. And so a miracle is God choosing to act in an extraordinary way. The God who Christians believe and know is always at work. He is not outside nature. But as Colossians says, he sustains all things. He upholds all things by the word of his power, the book of Hebrews says. So it's not as if God is outside nature and it's functioning by his rules. God is always acting in the world and in nature. But there are times in which he chooses to act in an extraordinary, in an anomalous, in a different way. So when we use the word miracles, and I'm not suggesting you stop 
those other uses, but we need to understand when we're talking about miracles in the life of the Lord Jesus and in the New Testament sense, we're talking about something of a very distinct kind. And that is something for which no natural explanation can account, where we can only attribute that to something outside of nature. So the question then is, can miracles happen? And there are three answers. There's a many more than that, but there's three possible ones. The first is that miracles are impossible. And they're impossible because nature is all that there is, and the rules of nature in and of themselves determine what will happen. Brooke Spinoza was a well-known philosopher in the 18th century who popularized that particular understanding and his point simply, and he was, well, nobody's quite sure what he was, whether he was a deist or somebody who just believed everything was God, a pantheist in that particular way. But he said that the laws of nature are the nature of God and even God himself couldn't violate his own laws because the laws of nature are bound up in that particular way, so significantly with the nature and character of God. And more, natural, more recently, we have, of course, uh, naturalism and scientism calling us and reminding us that nature is all there is, spoken powerfully by the new atheists in a particular way, attacking any idea that there's anything more than nature. Now the challenge is, even when we think about Spinoza's position, that science works on a specific form, and that is science essentially says by its nature that we can believe what is present because we can reproduce it, or it is reproducible or predictable in some particular way. But even science gets to the point where it has to back and weigh and say, well, there are some events that are beyond that. For example, the very concept of the Big Bang is something that can't be repeated, won't be repeated, and can only be the product of another kind of understanding rather than the normal scientific method. And the recognition that the laws of nature are generalizations has become even more common since we moved out of the 19th century where Newton and his physics were the kind of way of explaining everything, although Newton was very much a believing Christian. But when quantum mechanics came along, it became evident that there was a lot less determinism and predictability that could be easily put into equations. But most of all, God is not a prisoner in the nature he created. So David Hume came along in the 19th century, and he came with a different kind of equation. He believed exactly what Spinoza did, that miracles are impossible because nature is ultimately all there is. But he also said miracles are improvable. And they're improvable because if you take about what probability is, it will always be pro probable that miracles are less probable than a non-miracle. So there will be an explanation. And the problem is the people who believed in miracles were people who didn't have a scientific understanding of the world and they didn't know how things worked. Now, there are several things that are significant about that. And Hume has become very significant in terms of history, and I won't go into that. But basically, his argument is in some ways circular. And it begs the question, but quite apart from those philosophical things, we need to recognize that the ancients weren't nearly as gullible as often modern people tend to think they were. They clearly didn't know the science that we know. And yet they did know some certain things that were pretty obvious. They, uh, Jonathan, Joseph's problem, when he was told that Mary was going to have a child, or Mary had a child, was not that he didn't know how children came, it was because he did know how children came. And when he's told it's going to be a virgin birth, he knew that that was not possible unless God had intervened. And people in the ancient world knew that dead people didn't come back to life again, especially after four days in the tomb. 
but they believed because they were seeing something that was so obvious to them and so clear to them. It's true that there are people who are gullible. It's true that there are people who are superstitious. It's true that there are people who are easily taken in, but there was evidence that was undeniable, and that's especially for a Christian related to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Beneath the challenge to miracles being either possible or provable is the question of whether God exists. Because if God enters into the equation, if there is more to this world than the immediate, then we've got something else going on. So the third view is that miracles are both possible and provable. Not provable in the way that a scientist can do it, because we're not talking about scientific proof when we're talking about a singular event in the past. You can't go back and prove that. But you can use different kind of evidence, and that is historical evidence, legal kind of evidence, in which, as we talk about in a legal system, someone can be proved guilty beyond a shadow of doubt. <coughs> That doesn't mean you can take back a video and see what is there. It, it means that you can present evidence in such a way that anybody of reasonable intelligence can draw the conclusion that this happened in the past. That's the way all history comes to us. So to so simply discard what we have in the New Testament as impossible and improvable begs the question of then how do we properly explain who Jesus is and particularly his resurrection? So for the Christian, the great central question of history is, did Jesus rise from the dead on Easter Sunday morning? Was the grave empty? And were there credible people who saw him alive? And was their sight of Jesus such that it transformed their lives and caused them to live in an entirely different way? So let's step back from that. And obviously, the Bible makes it clear that miracles are possible and provable in some particular way, so there's eyewitness testimony, but I do want to say, on the other hand, we need to agree. Yes, miracles are unusual. Yes, miracles are unique. They don't happen all the time. You read some Christian books and you read them and they simply say, uh, expect a miracle today. Well, if you can expect them every day, they're not miracles. Miracles are exceptional, unusual interventions of God where he overrules the normal to be involved in life at the present. So we ought to be skeptical about accounts. We do know people are, credible, uh, are deceitful. We do know that people uh, can be credulous and believe things that they ought not to be. We should investigate. But faith in Christ is not believing without proof. Uh, so... Often people from a naturalist bent will say, well, I have science and you have faith. I have science that's based on proof or evidence. And you have faith which is based on nothing. Christian faith is not a blind leap in the dark. It is faith, trust, grounded in sufficient, significant evidence. And our life works that way in all kinds of ways that we cannot prove certain things. Uh, Elizabeth could not prove that I would be a worthy husband, and she had to take a massive leap of trust. <laughs> she had some miniature evidence that I would be a, an acceptable husband, but she acted on that basis. Now, she's not here, so I can say all kinds of things about that, but it's gonna be videoed, so we'll leave it at that particular point. So let me talk a little bit about the miracles of Jesus. The miracles of Jesus recorded in the New Testament number probably 35 specific miracles. 
there's different ways of counting, and so some say 31, some say 37. Uh, I think the number is 35. It's because sometimes we have accounts and we're wondering whether this is a double or a single. Only one of them is mentioned in all five of the Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. But miracles abound more than that. That's why we read Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. That's why we read Matthew chapter 11. That's outside of the account of 35 discuss, discussed, described miracles in the life of our Lord Jesus. And they tend to fall into three main categories. The New Testament doesn't use these, but they're handy for us. There are miracles of healing. There are miracles of exorcism, casting out demons, and a number of them were that. And they're what we would call nature miracles. Nature miracles, water turning into wine, Jesus calming a storm, Jesus walking on the water. And there's a number of others that we can talk about that affect the control of nature itself. Beyond the miracles that Jesus did, we need to recognize that for our understanding of the person of Jesus, there are a cluster of miracles in which he is involved and, and, and it wasn't so much a miracle he did and yet he was a part of. So we have his birth, a miraculous birth, the virgin birth of Christ. We have the events related and circling his birth. And then we have his baptism where a voice appeared out of heaven. We have his transfiguration on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was changed and Moses and Elijah came alongside him. And most of all, we have the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He says, I will take my life. But most times in the New Testament, it's God the Father raised him from the dead. So to extract miracles from the life of the Lord Jesus is to take out more than 30% of the Gospels relate to miracles of the Lord Jesus. But it isn't just the Lord Jesus, pardon me, it isn't just the New Testament that tells us about the miracles of the Lord Jesus. It's also Jesus' enemies. So we have in the New Testament itself the Jewish leaders who looked at what he did and they said, this man does miracles by the power of Beelzebub. Now implicit in that was the recognition that he did works that could not be explained in any other way. So they disagreed not on the fact that he'd healed, not on the fact that he'd cast out demons. They said he was doing it by an evil power. Josephus. The writer of the New Testament, uh, pardon me, of, of the history of Israel in the first century uh, says simply about him in one of these places, at this time, referring to the New Testament period, there appeared Jesus, a wise man. He was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. A doer of startling deeds. The Talmud. The record of the Jewish rabbis records this. It has been taught on the eve of Passover, Jesus was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he is going to be stoned because he's practiced sorcery, magic, evil powers. So again, their witness is that he was killed because he practiced sorcery, attributing it in that particular way. And there's a kind of confusion there because it says he was hanged and he was going to be stoned. Obviously, we know he was crucified. Celsus, who writes as a non-Jew in the first and the second century, says he was brought up, Jesus was, in secret in Egypt and hired himself as a workman in Egypt. And having tried his hand at certain magical powers, he returned from there and on account of these powers gave himself the title of God. So even there, there's the testimony that there were works and deeds that he did. Now, whether or not that's an accurate description is still, you can't deny that Jesus was not just a teacher who went around. His enemies claimed he did deeds for which he was to be looked at because they had supernatural power between them. They said it was evil supernatural power. Even today, some of the most uh, skeptical critics in the New Testament, people like Bart Ehrman and Marcus Borg and John uh, Crossan, 
believe that Jesus existed and that he was viewed, and they will say that, as a healer and as an exorcist. They don't, uh, in that particular way, agree with that view. But it's undeniable that he was viewed as a healer and as an exorcist. So why? What were the miracles all about? Why was Jesus doing what he was doing? So let me suggest what the miracles weren't. Three things, and you could add to this list. First of all, the miracles of Jesus were not spectacles designed to impress and create awe. He, he didn't do those kind of amazing things like having a tree uproot and then replant over here or having a mountain move from one place to another. As a matter of fact, interestingly, that was one of Satan's temptations to him. Cast yourself down so the people will see who you are from the side of the temple and, and display your power so they will be awestruck by that kind of power. His, his brothers, it says in John chapter 7, who didn't believe in him at the time, came to him sarcastically saying, hey, if anybody wants to be a big shot, they go to Jerusalem. And if you want to make yourself somebody, go to Jerusalem and do your miracles there so they'll follow you. And Jesus would have nothing to do with that. His miracles were not just spectacles of display that created awe and created a following. Secondly, his miracles were not public relations stunts. Fairly close to what I just said, but Jesus turns to his, the, 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 pardon me, the Jewish leaders come to him and said, uh, if you want us to believe in you, do a miracle for us. And Jesus in Matthew 12 looks at them and excoriates them and says, no sign will be given to you, you wicked, adulterous generation. The other side is that at least four or five times in his ministry, he did a miracle. And then he tells the person, don't tell anyone. Make sure you tell no one. Don't tell anyone. That's not very good public relations. Of course, in each case, they disobeyed. But Jesus was not doing it simply to make an impression. Thirdly, the miracles of Jesus were not random acts of kindness. Now, there's nothing wrong with random acts of kindness. And if you watch Honda commercials, you'll see them doing random acts of kindness about Southern California. And, they're all fine in and of themselves. But Jesus' acts maybe were acts of kindness, but they weren't random. He could have healed everyone. But he didn't. His acts were not random. He goes to the pool of Bethesda where there's all kinds of people lying there and chooses to heal one man. And the one he chooses is hardly the primary candidate of a person that I would want to see healed. He was a pain in the neck and the way he responded. So Jesus has something else going on than just doing miracles to gain a crowd. He discouraged that. As a matter of fact, early in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals his mother-in-law and then a bunch of other people on that night. And then the next morning, he goes out into the, into the quiet place in the wilderness away from everybody else. And Peter comes after him saying, what are you doing out here? They're all in there waiting for you. And Jesus says, let's go to another town. And that rather than playing on the miracles to draw a crowd, he insisted that there was something else about his life. So let me suggest quickly five things that we see in the miracles of Jesus. First of all, they were glimpses of his glory. Next week, we're going to look at John chapter 2 where it says simply after Jesus turns the water into wine, this first beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. Part of it was to display who he was and make it clear what his person was. Secondly, his miracles authenticated his message and his authority. That's why we read Acts chapter 2 where Peter turns explaining it that this 
Jesus, whom you crucified, was authenticated by God, by works of power, by marvels, and by signs. It's one of the common reasons for miracles in the Bible, to authenticate a messenger, to say, listen to him. This demonstrates that he has authority and power that comes from God. Thirdly, his miracles were foretastes of the kingdom. He'll say in Matthew chapter 12 to a group of people, many of them the Jewish leaders who were demanding a sign, he says, if I'm doing these things among you by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is present among you. And they were foretastes of what the kingdom of God was when Christ's rule would be manifested on the earth and in power in fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. Fourthly, his miracles were acts of power, displays of his power and his compassion. So he calms the storm, and the disciples who were fishermen look around at one another and say, what kind of person is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. And it says, and they feared him. The miracle made them afraid of Jesus. Fear in the sense of awe. And others are acts of compassion, obviously, as he comes alongside people who are broken. A woman who's had an issue of blood and has been outside society for year after year and she touches the hem of his garment and power goes out to her and he restores her. And we'll see other illustrations of that in the Gospels. And fifth, the miracles are acted parables of salvation. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead live, the grieving are turned to the joyful, the hopeless are turned to the hopeful. All of those are pictures of the salvation the Lord Jesus is going to bring. As in one of the first of his miracles, your sins are forgiven. What do you mean your sins are forgiven? Who are you to forgive sins? In order that you might know that the power, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, rise, pick up your bed and walk. It was a sign of salvation and forgiveness and healing. But when we think of all of the miracles that the Lord Jesus did, let me remind you, and as we go through this series together, we'll continue to push back to this. The greatest miracle is not what Jesus did. It is who Jesus was. The greatest miracle of Christ, the greatest miracle of Christianity, is the incarnation. God becoming man. The Word becoming flesh. And so we come into the presence of the Lord Jesus and we recognize Him as the miracle of all miracles. And then the miracle of all miracles is the one who was the God-man, became the crucified Savior and the risen Lord, seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven so that you and I might find life and forgiveness in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we think about in a cursory way this reality. We thank you that you are the living God, that you hold all creation in your hand, that you are the one through your Son who spoke and the world came into being. We thank you that in him is life and the life is the light of the man. We thank you that he upholds the world's by the word of his power, that he holds all things together as the sustainer of the universe. And we thank you that you, the great God, are not absent from our creation, that you're present within it over and over and over. And yet sometimes you step in to reveal yourself in new and extraordinary ways. We thank you supremely. 
that you stepped in personally in the person of Jesus. Help us to live in awe and wonder before him. Jesus Messiah, King and Lord of all. In his name we pray. Amen.